turning the little clamp that holds it into place. And now I'm going to take the mirror and uh, move it over to the barrel. As you can see, there's layers of, of paper here. There, there, you can see the red rouge stains in the paper from when I polished with the rouge last time. I've used rouge just once on the thing so far. Uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll think I'll put the mirror on first and then tell you what happened. trapping my fingers underneath the edge. Here it comes. Ah, there. Now what I'm going to do is you might be able to see the rouge stains running down the edge of the, the mirror. The red, that's red jeweler's rouge. It's a form of iron oxide. Very, very fine metallic particles. I, I, oxide particles. Now, I'm taking two halves of a clothespin I broke apart, which are just the right size. This, the mirror is a little bit larger than the tool. It's, that's why uh, the cleats are just right for putting these in. So these will just wedge in here like this, and one in here like this, between these cleats and the mirror. And I'm just shoving them in rather gently, just with maybe a pound or so of pressure. That will just help keep the mirror rotating and either maybe a couple of pounds of pressure, rotating this way while I'm trying to do the polishing stroke. Right now on the mirror, there's a raised zone near the edge, about between the edge and three inches in from the edge, right along here. And it gradually, uh, the radius of cur curvature gradually decreases as you go from this spot. I'll show you over here. Right from about here up to about there, the radius of curvature of the mirror decreases. And right at the very edge, there's a turned edge, down edge, about a quarter of an inch wide, which I probably will ignore because it's very difficult, especially in a large mirror, to get to the edge zone just perfect. I'd rather have a, a perfect 19-inch mirror than a really crummy 20-inch mirror. So you'd see vastly more with that in the sky, much better images and so on. Uh, this little chip here, that's a little chip that I knocked out of the face of the mirror, the optical face, but I foolishly tried to... Uh, um, grind the bevel on the edge with a, grind, with a rotating motorized grinding stone. Just do it by hand. It only takes about 15 minutes. That's far better. A little particle there of some kind, probably just a little bit of polishing agent left, a little bit of barn sight, which you can still see around the edge. The last time I polished this chip was right about here. What I've done when I put the mirror down here is rotate it about a fifth of the way around, about, you know, about like uh, not quite 90 degrees, 75 or 80 degrees. And the next time I polish, I'll put it here, about a fifth of the way around. That'll help the mirror, if it's, if it's under a slight amount of stress, even though it's supported by a cushion, then it'll be less likely to get astigmatic if you keep rotating it every time you do a figuring step. Now, what I'm going to do next is, oh, I'll tell you briefly what happened. At the end of normal polishing with barn sight, which you saw me doing, uh, the mirror was badly deformed. It was in the. F I, I did some looking at it very carefully, and to make a long story short, it was initially with a crude optical test I did before I got my proper Fousseau test set up. It was all probably between an inch and a half and two inches of longitudinal aberration with that edge coming up, just like I told you, uh, and uh, also the center in a deformed. Uh, it's in the form of a, an oblate spheroid with a longitudinal aberration about four or five, maybe six times that of a normal paraboloid and in the wrong direction. In other words, a paraboloid is supposed to have the curve get shallower and shallower. That is, the radius of curvature gets slightly longer as you go from center to edge. With this, the radius of curvature was getting shorter and shorter as you went from center to edge. It was so bad that if I held a flashlight trying to find where to put the Fousseau tester, uh, back at the other end of the basement where I've got the Fousseau, set, Fousseau test set up, 
then as you move the flashlight back and forth like this, you could actually see the, the, the bulb of the flashlight and the lens at the front actually distort in shape as it moved from the center of the mirror to the edge. Now that's really bad when that happens. So you're, I was way out by quite a bit. So what I did was looked in Texrow's book, How to Make a Telescope, and it, say, and it showed that if you've got a, an oblate sphere, an oblate ellipsoid, you can actually treat it as though it's a sphere and start with long parabolizing strokes, which is what I did. And in order to speed up the process, I used Barnsight instead of Rouge. And it took about, I think, approximately 10 hours of brute force, horrible polishing strokes, almost the entire, with the mirror on top, like, like this, long W polishing strokes, just like in Texero's book, in order to bring it back to more, more or less the state it's in now. The center part, which we, like, uh, inside this raised edge zone is almost a perfect sphere. And I've already done one figuring step with uh, rouge. So I'm going to put the rouge on now and just show you how that works. And you won't be able to see me now. I'm out of the camera range. And what I'm doing now, as I don't have much rouge left, I'll sort of hold the bottle up here if you can see it. There's just a neatsy teensy bit right down at the bottom. And I've got another thing of rouge that I bought from Mepton Science in Toronto, a big jar of it, but I can't find it. But this is left over from 30 years ago when I made my 12-inch and 26-inch mirrors. So it's, 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 it's very old, but still good. I got some rouge from another company, and it was contaminated and wrecked a friend of mine's mirror, and I had to regrind it from number 80 onwards. So I value this old rouge very highly. There's still a little bit of rouge left on the surface of the mirror from when I polished the last, so I don't have to add much rouge this time, mostly just water. There'll be some on the polishing tool, the pitch lap as well. So I'm just, I just may just dig a little bit of rouge in here, especially near the edge where I'll be doing my polishing mostly today. I don't, I used to wipe it on with a brush, but now I just kind of pat it on. So you can see the red rouge appearing here and there. I'm going to take a break during the time after, I'll be cold pressing this just for a few minutes which I, before I actually start polishing, to make sure the pitch lap has a reasonably good chance of conforming precisely to the surface of the mirror. And while that's happening, while the tool is just sitting there, I'm going to take a, uh, a ruler, a long ruler and a marking pen, and just mark off the exact center of the polishing tool as close as I can at the back, so that I can more precisely ju judge what I'm doing, because what I'm going to be doing is removing this edge zone around the edge. That's right where I'm patting right now. That's where it's raised a little bit. I'm going to try and remove that by polishing with, with uh, W strokes that are concentrated over the edge of the mirror with the tool on top. As you can see, the mirror is on the bottom now. It's pretty obvious. See, I've added just a little bit of rouge there, which will probably be enough. And you'll see the uh, sort of the acclimatizing method I use. This is very crude. I would be doing it much better if I had more rouge to work with. I could probably tear the basement apart and find that other thing of rouge, but I'm too lazy to do that. And, there's probably enough rouge left in this bottle to do the job with this mirror anyway. I'm adding quite a bit of water because it, it really evaporates quickly. You'd be amazed how fast evaporation takes place in the winter when it's, the humidity is not as high. This is nearly the end of December, but two thousand nearly the end of December 2003. So, okay, now what I'm going to do is put the tool in place. As you can see, I don't know whether you can see it in the frame but I've got this cover that I made a special cover with a plastic liner that's pretty well dust proof. And I turn that over, and there's a dust proof ceiling cover on the ceiling too. I may have said that before. Put that up there, and then I just take the polishing tool. And very gently lower it onto the face of the mirror. This has to be done with considerable finesse. One thing about it, this tool doesn't weigh nearly as much. It weighs about half of what the mirror blank does. It's not that bad a job. Probably about 20 pounds. It still has to be done very carefully, though. As you can see, I'm kind of using my fingers to kind of guide it in. There we are. Now let it sit for a second and then just kind of, whoops. See how easily it twists? It wouldn't do that if I didn't have this plastic cover. But I'll just kind of slide it around a little, back and forth maybe to start with. I probably don't have quite enough water on there. It doesn't like being dry. Now you can see why not too many amateurs like to make large telescope mirrors anymore, or telescope makers mirrors, period. 
I've got quite a bit of what I'll use about half of this jar of water just to do above the roof, just to do a little figuring. It's amazing how much it takes. I like to kind of, I don't do what you call a real cold pressing. My 26 inch mirror stuck to the pitch top once when I tried that and it broke off pitch squares and everything trying to get it apart. It was just a total nightmare. So what I do now is I do do a little bit of cold pressing, especially when I'm trying to find figure the mirror like I am now. But what I do is just leave it on there for maybe a minute or so and then move it around. Keep shifting it around every 30 seconds, just a little bit. Maybe do a few W strokes, stuff like that, just to kind of break in the surface a little bit. And that way the thing won't stick. It'll gradually conform to the mirror, but it won't stick to it. See how that rotates? It's kind of a nuisance, but... I'll jam these in a little tighter. Whoops, even that's not working too well. There. Uh, yep, yeah, it's really, really giving me problems today. Just a little stiff. There. There we go. Just kind of break it in a little bit. It's actually, I polished just, I think, two or three days ago. So, it's really not uh, too bad. The, the tool has not had a chance to sag too much over the last few days. Also, being at the winter, it's a little bit colder in the, in the basement now. The pitch is a little bit stiffer. Right now, uh, the old photographic thermometer says it's about 63 and a half degrees Fahrenheit down here at, at, the, at the shoulder level, or well, waist level. Where I'm polishing, it's about six, maybe 64, 63 and a half degrees Fahrenheit, something like that, which is not bad. It was about 70 in here when I was when I started polishing in the fall. So this thing has popped out right there. So I just have to kind of play it by ear with these things. Just gradually. This feels very smooth, by the way. It's not sticking like very much like the barn site did. Okay, it's just a little stiff because the tool is going to have to break in for a minute. Okay, while it's a cold pressing right now. I'm going to shut the camera off and just go up and get to, I don't want to waste too much videotape. I'm going to get the ruler and just stretch it across to make an X in the center. I'll just shut the camera off and go up and get that uh, ruler. It's got a cold press for about five minutes, I would say. Here I am. I think it's recording now. I'm just going to check to make sure the tape is moving. It's hard to see without my reading glasses on. Yes, indeed, the videotape is, is rotating, so it's actually recording now. That's good. As far as I can tell, it's recording, yeah. I hate to do all I have to do this over again, just because the, the tape machine wasn't turned on. Yeah, she's rotating. Okay. Uh, the machine tends to, you have to push the start button twice to start it going, because uh, if you leave it for a few minutes, in order to conserve battery power, it tends to shut off. Of course, naturally, I'm, I'm plug this is plugged into the uh, to an AC adapter right now, so it's not actually using battery power, but it still automatically kind of shuts off when it's not uh, when it's not being run after a few minutes. So, because can, I don't know whether you could see it, there's a gigantic X with a little black spot in the center of it there. I hope this doesn't mean that my telescope will end up being X-rated. Terrible joke, but it had to be said. Just think. I'll be one of the X-Men. Pardon me, X-Men. That's, uh, that's good. Okay, what I'm doing now, just kind of swiveling it around, kind of breaking it in a little bit. Maybe I'll use a few little one-third strokes or shorter strokes just to kind of make sure the tool is functioning. Okay, I'm just uh, stroking it around a little. I did this for about five minutes or so before I did the first figuring step with Rouge. And it ended up, there was a, quite a bit of optical roughness, like large primary and micro ripple, on the surface of the mirror at the end of the last large massive figuring step with Barnsight. After this little step with Rouge, the surface was just as smooth as silk. You would not believe how a 